Intel's x99 platform has become an interesting option for budget-oriented PC builders. With the used market being flooded by X-server CPUs, there are quite a few Chinese companies now producing motherboards for them at pretty low costs. Can we build a system with one of these from AliExpress, and will it run sim racing titles well? I'm building this system around the X99 PR9 from Machinist, which was highly rated by the excellent YouTube channel Mikonst. I'll leave a link to the review of this motherboard. Go check them out for a deeper dive on this platform and more budget PC building too. And the CPU we'll be working with today is the E5 2643 V4. It's a Broadwell architecture chip with six cores and 12 threads, a base clock of 3.4 gigahertz, boosting up to 3.7. And this has 20 megabytes of L3 cache, which should make a big difference in the performance. And it'll be paired with the Crucial P3 one terabyte NVMe and 16 gigabytes of DDR4 from the $200 sim racing PC build as well. But I don't think I'm gonna be able to get the memory much higher in 2400 megahertz, so that's something to note. And then the GPU will be going with the RTX 3060, as I think this card is a great option to pair with this platform, as it's strong value for the money. And I feel that if someone wanted to go for a higher tier GPU than this, that they should also consider just investing in a little bit more in the CPU and motherboard side as well. And also note that for these AliExpress motherboards, you will need to source your own CR2032 battery. I used this Duracell one that I had on hand, but even cheap ones on Amazon should work just fine. Now I'd like to introduce this case. It's a very old home theater PC case from Silverstone that I've had sitting around unused for a few years. I want to use this for all of my future budget PC builds as I think it does a great job representing what could be found on the used market if you're willing to accept a less than lackluster appearance and overall design. And it'll be paired with the 650 watt power supply, which should be enough to power this system with the 3080 as well. And for the CPU cooler, I originally decided to go with the well-regarded Thermalright Peerless Assassin 120. Uh, not the SE version, as the SE version doesn't appear to come with the proper mounting hardware for LGA 2011. So when doing this build, make sure that the CPU cooler you pick has the correct mounting hardware. And this cooler is a great investment to stick with you for future builds, provided you make sure not to lose the mounting hardware for it. But in my case, it proved to be just a tiny bit too tall for the case to close. And I originally considered leaving it open, uh, but I decided it would be best to just try to find a lower profile option and allow this system to be considered a finished build. And thankfully, Thermalright had just the right solution and for a great price. The SI100 has the proper mounting brackets we need, and a good basic design too. It looks promising, and now everything fits. And also, uh, my apologies to those of you with uh, sensitivity for cable management, as there's none to be found in this build. So uh, yeah, it's just gonna be that way, I think. <laughs> I also had a bit of difficulty finding the X99 chipset drivers. For some reason, Intel made it so these drivers just can't be found. But with a little bit of digging, they are available directly from Intel. So. I'll leave a link in this video description in case anyone needs it. And then lastly, these tests were done on the NVIDIA GeForce driver version 551.23. So with all that covered, let's jump into the test results. So starting off with F123, we're running on the high preset with an isotropic filtering set to 8 times. The average frame rate is 118 frames per second with 1% lows at 88.5 and 0.1% lows at 58.5. So overall the average frame rate is pretty good, but there are some noticeable dips. Uh, it's not terrible stutters, but it does show up and it is something that can be slightly distracting compared to a more premium experience. And I think this is something that does show up on a few of the different titles that we're testing. So onto Dirt Rally 2, we're running on Ultra with 8x MSAA and 8x anisotropic filtering. Average frame rates at 88.5, 1% lows at 63.7, and 0.1% lows at an even 60. So this is a much more consistent frame rate and consistent experience, and I'd say Dirt Rally is uh, uh, definitely Dirt Rally 2 is a definitely a solid experience on this system. So now jumping into Automobilista 2, we're running with high settings across the board with an isotropic filtering set to 8 times. 
The average frame rate is 130.6 with 1% lows at 94.1 and 0.1% lows at 75.5. So this is another game that there was a considerable drop with the 1% and 0.1% lows. It wasn't terribly noticeable to me though. Overall when I was driving I didn't feel like it was uh, something that was distracting or anything, but the numbers do show that, that there is a bit of a difference here. So now let's jump into Beam MG. This is on the normal preset. Average frame rates at 67.3 with 1% lows at 44.8 and 0.1% lows at 29.2. So this is one of the weaker performances for this platform. I feel like just the CPU architecture and lack of CPU cores as well with only 6 cores and 12 threads makes it a little bit challenging to run this game. It might work better with low settings but I feel like the overall consistency of the frame rate is still going to be a little bit iffy even if you get high average frame rate with a lower preset setting on their graphics. So Beam NG is still pretty playable, I felt like it was still a fun experience, uh, it just could be better with a different platform perhaps. So now let's get into a set of course of Competizione. This is running on the mid or medium preset. Uh, average frame rates at 68.8 with 1% uh, lows at 46.3. But the 0.1% lows went all the way down to 6. So this was noticeable every so often it would just suddenly stutter very badly. Um, I was able to drive around it just, uh, you know, trying to ignore it and not think about it, but it was pretty distracting and I think uh, ACC is probably the uh, worst experience overall uh, for this platform. I think that it may have ran better if I ran it on the low preset and uh, it's something that it would be worth exploring. If I was going to play this game on this system, I would try it on low instead of medium. Uh, it's something to keep in mind. So let's get into R Factor 2 now. Uh, this is on the Ultra preset with Ultra Post Processing. The average frame rate's at 69.5 with 1% lows at 46.4 and 0.1% lows at 39.3. So this is another one where I feel like the CPU performance is holding things back a little bit. And uh, I, I think that it might be another one where maybe the high preset might be a little bit better, especially when it comes to the um, higher average frame rate. But it, this is another one where I still think that the uh, low per 1% and 0.1% lows are being affected by this older CPU architecture and uh, we would probably see a little bit better performance from something more modern, maybe on AM4. So now let's get into Race Room with max settings and the textures maxed out as well. Uh, average frame rate is at 80.1 with 1% lows at 51.3 and 0.1% lows at 48 even. So this is another game where I feel like uh, the older CPU architecture is holding it back as well. Uh, race Room is notoriously uh, difficult to get like a higher frame rate with the older CPUs or with uh, not as strong a CPU. So I think it's another one where we might want to look into AM4 being a better option and it's something where we can compare those two platforms uh, maybe in one of the future videos. I'm happy with the way that this Xeon E5-2643 V4 CPU performed in this testing, especially considering the overall low cost of this build. That all comes down to how plentiful these old server chips are, which drove the development of these budget-oriented X99 motherboards in the first place. If we look to tally up the cost of this build, we can see that overall, we spent $44 on the motherboard, $22 on the CPU, $35 for the memory and $70 for SSD as the pricing has been shifting a little bit on those. And I did set aside $60 for the power supply, although this can vary depending on which model you get. And I left it open-ended for the case as well as I'm using just something I had laying around and this can vary for you depending on if you go for something new in the $40 to $50 range maybe or go and find something used potentially as well. So overall that would total up to $231 without the case and not including the GPU as I feel there's a lot of variables there as well when it comes to the total cost of the build depending on what GPU you go for and if you're able to find any deals uh, on the used market. 
So again, I'm really happy with this system, really pleased with what we've been able to do. And I'm gonna be looking to uh, do some testing with AM4 coming up soon and uh, looking forward to diving in with that. And if you stayed so far, I just wanna say thanks again for watching my videos. I really appreciate all of you who have subscribed and commented on my videos and uh, look forward to doing more for you guys. And uh, thanks again for watching and take care.